And we're going to start by looking at the prophecy of Jacob about Judah. Uh, we've talked about this before already in Genesis chapter 49, verse 8 and 9 and 10. Um, in Genesis chapter 49, when the patriarch Jacob, or Israel, um, gave prophecies about his 12 sons. He, he prophesied about each of them just before his death. We've taken a look at Ephraim in some detail. And right now we're going to take a look at what he said about Judah. Starting in verse 8, he said, Judah, thou art he who thy brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thy enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Judah is a lion's whelp. That's a cub. A lion's cub. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down, he couched as a lion, and as an old lion, who shall rouse him up? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. So there's a few things here we could look at. The scepter shall not depart from Judah. Now that's an interesting statement because in part one, we took a look at how Judah gave his staff and his ring and his bracelets to Tamar when he thought she was a prostitute. He traded them for sex. And then three months later, when she was found to be pregnant, she used those items to prove who the father of her child was. And so Judah lost his scepter, his staff, and he got it back when it was revealed that he was the father of Tamar's children. So the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, that is from his... Uh, progeny, his, his ancestry, until Shiloh comes, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Now Shiloh means peace, security, safety. There are actually two times that the scepter departs from Judah. The first time is with Tamar, as we have looked at. And if you remember, the first time the scepter departed from Judah, it was when Tamar became pregnant. And her two children, as we discussed in part one and two, represent the first and second coming of Christ. So that was the first time the scepter departed from Judah. And then he got it back when Tamar proved who the father of her children were. When the, tr when the truth came out about Judah. Now, if we look at this verse a little closer again, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh comes. And to him shall the gathering of the people be. So what's Shiloh? Shiloh is a person. To him, Shiloh, to him shall the gathering of the people be. And the scepter, you could look at this a different way. You can say the scepter shall depart from Judah when Shiloh comes. You see, so this is how the scepter fits in with when Jesus Christ came. That's when the Shiloh departed from between Judah's feet. The, the sun has come, so the promise is finished. So Judah, the, the, he, Jesus fulfilled this prophecy about Judah. So now, since Christ, 
there is no longer a lawgiver between the feet of Judah because the lawgiver has been born and the scepter has departed from Judah and gone into the hand this is the kingship the rulership has gone into the hand of the one who was coming who is Jesus Christ and Shiloh which means peace safety security this rep this is a, a representation of Jesus Christ and to him shall the gathering of the people be so if we look back at our our chart of the children of Judah the five children the children of under Tamar are not actually Judah's children I think that might be why she had twins because there are two husbands that Tamar did not have children from first Ur her first husband who was the son of Judah and he was uh, killed because he was wicked then the second husband Onan was supposed to give her children for Ur but he didn't he spilled his seed on the ground so the twins are her reward from both of those events so there is a relation there and the spilling the seed on the ground of Judah was related to the second temple as we talked about where they mingled their pure blood with their pure race with other races which they were told not to do but that was under the old covenant under the new covenant it's not by race it's not by genetics it's by the spirit so that that is also representing the second coming which is not uh, who who will will be caught up with Jesus in the second coming is not by race it's by spirit so that has also to do with spilling the seed on the ground it's not by seed anymore it's by spirit the ancient town of Shiloh ended up being rejected by God remember Shiloh was in a, a, a town in Ephraim where they set up the tent of that that they made under the leadership of Moses and that was the sanctuary where the sacrifices were held the ark was kept there for many years until Saul lost it to the Philistines and then it came back on its own and it was kept in a town near the palace of Saul since then until David brought it to Jerusalem so that was the first Shiloh um, now that was named Shiloh probably because of this prophecy of Jacob until Shiloh comes now the old Shiloh was rejected for the temple system we see this clearly in Psalm 78 for they provoked him to anger with their high places and moved him to jealousy with their graven images when God heard this he was wroth and greatly abhorred Israel so that he forsook the tabernacle of Shiloh the tent which he placed among men and he delivered his strength into captivity and his glory into the enemy's hand he gave his people over also unto the sword and was wroth with his inheritance the fire consumed their young men and their maidens were not given in marriage their priests fell by the sword and their widows made no lamentation then the Lord waked as one out of sleep and like a mighty man that shouts by reason of wine and he smote his enemies in the hinder parts and he put them to a perpetual reproach moreover he refused the tabernacle of Joseph and chose not the tribe of Ephraim but chose the tribe of Judah 
the Mount Zion which he loved. And he built his sanctuary like high places, like the earth which he has established forever. He chose David also his servant, and took him from the sheepfolds. From following the ewes, great with young, he brought him to feed Jacob his people, and Israel his inheritance. So he fed them according to the integrity of his heart, and guided them by the skillfulness of his hands. So we see the old Shiloh rejected for the temple system, and then the temple system rejected on behalf of Christ, because that was the final destruction of the temple. King David and his son Solomon built the first temple. And when that happened, they brought the ark. Instead of David, instead of bringing the ark back to Shiloh in the northern kingdom, he brought the ark to Jerusalem, which started the Temple of Solomon. So there's a shift here um, in a couple of ways about Shiloh. First of all, Shiloh is the one who is coming, the seed of David. So it's still the seed of Judah because David is of the seed of Judah. But now it's more specific. It's of the seed of David. And also Shiloh has been rejected in favor of this temple system to prepare for the one who is to come. The real Shiloh, who is Jesus Christ, the, the, the new covenant, the gospel of peace. Um, Jesus Christ is known as the King of Peace, the Prince of Righteousness. There's a key event that we've already looked at that I'm going to bring it up again because this is very important. This is a key event about David. It's found in 2 Samuel chapter 7, starting in verse 1. And it came to pass when the king sat in his house, and the Lord had given him rest round about from all his enemies, that the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells within curtains. And Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that is in thy heart, for the Lord is with thee. And it came to pass that night that the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, Thus says the Lord, Shall thou build me a house for me to dwell in? Whereas I have not dwelt in any house since the time that I brought up the children of Israel out of Egypt, even to this day, but have walked in a tent and in a tabernacle. In all the places wherein I have walked with all the children of Israel, spoke I a word with any of the tribes of Israel, whom I commanded to feed my people Israel, saying, Why build ye not me a house of cedar? Now therefore, so shall thou say unto my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took thee from the sheep coat, from following the sheep, to be ruler over my people, over Israel. And I was with thee whithersoever thou went, and have cut off all thy enemies out of thy sight, and have made thee a great name, like unto the name of the great men that are in the earth. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, that they may dwell in a place of their own, and move no more. Neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them any more, as before time. And as since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, and have caused thee to rest from all thy enemies, also the Lord telleth thee that he will make thee a house. And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom." He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men, and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him, as I took it from Saul, 
who I put away before thee. And thy house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. And that was told to David by God. And at first people thought that David's son Solomon was the fulfillment of this. And this it was Solomon who erected the first temple. But Solomon... Um, failed to maintain his kingdom. So it was a future son of David, which turned out to be Jesus Christ. He was a son of David. And his kingdom was established forever by God. Now, was Jesus a lawgiver? The great lawgiver? Uh, here are some verses we can take a look at that show... Uh, that Jesus is the lawgiver. These are mainly from the book of Isaiah, because Isaiah is uh, very much a messianic prophet, and he speaks a lot about the Messiah as a lawgiver. Isaiah 42, verse 1 to 9. Behold my servant, who I uphold, my elect, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed shall he not break, and the smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. He shall not fail, nor be discouraged, till he has set judgment in the earth, and the isles shall wait for his law. So from this part of Isaiah 42, we see that this is talking about Jesus, the Messiah, bringing in the law. I have put my spirit upon him. He brings forth judgment to the Gentiles. The, the, the gospel of peace went forth to the Gentiles through the Greek language. He set judgment in the earth and the isles. The Isles of the Nations is, in ancient times was referring to the Asian Sea. The Isles of the Nations, which generally speaking is the Greek people. The New Testament went through the Greek language into Greece and then to Rome. And it spread. Thus says God the Lord, He that created the heavens and stretched them out, he that spread forth the earth and that which comes out of it. He that gives breath unto the people upon it and spirit to them that walk therein. I the Lord have called thee in righteousness and will hold thy hand and will keep thee and give thee for a covenant of the people, for a light of the Gentiles, to open the blind eyes and to bring out the prisoners from the prison and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. I am the Lord, and that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. Behold, the former things are come to pass, and new things do I declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. This part of Isaiah 42 is talking about the new covenant. When he's talking about uh, I have called thee in righteousness. I will hold your hand and give you for a covenant of the people for a light of the Gentiles. And letting them out of the prison. And now he says, I am the, my, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I will not give to another, nor, nor my praise to graven images. So he's bringing in a new thing too. He's saying the former things have come to pass and new things I declare. Um, he's not giving his glory to another because Jesus is God. Now if we skip ahead in Isaiah 42 up to verse 17, they shall be turned back they shall be greatly ashamed that trust in graven images. They say to the molten images, You are our gods. Hear you deaf, and look you blind, that you may see. Who is blind but my servant, 
or deaf as my messenger that I sent? Who is blind as he that is perfect, and blind as the Lord's servant, seeing many things, but thou observes not, opening the ears, but he hears not? The Lord is well pleased for his righteousness' sake, and he will magnify the law and make it honorable. So how did Jesus magnify the law? If we look at the Sermon on the Mount, this is a perfect example in Matthew chapter 5. We look at um, beginning in uh, adultery. Matthew five twenty seven. You heard, You have heard it was said by them of old time, Thou shall not commit adultery. This is from the law of Moses. This is one of the Ten Commandments. But I say to you, whoever looks on a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. So don't even look at a woman with lust. That's adultery too. So this is magnifying the law. Um, if, your right eye, if your right eye offends thee, pluck it out. And cast it from thee, for it's more profitable for you that one of your members should perish that, and not your whole body should be cast into hell. Um, now on divorce, verse 31, it has been said, whoever shall put away his wife, let, her, let him give her a writing of divorce. Well, that's from the law of Moses again. But I say to you, whoever shall put away his wife, except for the cause of fornication or adultery, causes her to commit adultery. And whoever shall marry her that is divorced commits adultery. So this again magnifies the law very much. Um, loving your enemies, starting in verse 38. You have heard it has been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. This is again from the law of Moses. And it's not only to say, take vengeance on someone. If they knock out your tooth, knock out his tooth. The principle being put forth here is that if he knocks out one of your teeth, you only knock out one of his teeth. You don't knock out all of his teeth. If he knocks out one of your eyes, you only knock out one of his eyes, not both of his eyes. So when you take vengeance, the vengeance should meet the punishment of what was done. So it's sort of a limiting factor. It's not a license to just take vengeance for everything. But anyway, so Jesus said, You have heard it has been said, An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you that you resist not evil. Whoever shall smite you on your right cheek, turn to him the other cheek. And whoever asks you to go one mile, go two miles. And it goes on, and he says, Love your enemy. Okay, you have heard it has been said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. This again is from the Old Covenant, the Law of Moses. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which use you and persecute you. Because he says, he goes on to explain that if you love those who love you and hate those who hate you, then aren't you the same as they are? You need to be better than them. You need to love your enemies and love those who hate you. So again, this greatly magnifies the law. And this is the real law, the real spiritual law of God. And we could go on for hours and hours of ways that Jesus did this. And in all of his parables also, his law is within his parables. And all these principles that you actually have to use parables because it goes beyond the words. It, it's not just, you can't just make one law 
It's not just one written law for people to follow. It's a principle to live by. So this is another way where he greatly magnifies the law. It, it's a spiritual principle and you are guided by the Spirit of God. It's a whole new covenant. So there we again we see Jesus is the lawgiver. In Isaiah chapter 51 starting in verse 4 to 8. Hearken unto me my people and give ear unto me O my nation for a law shall proceed from me, and I will make my judgment to rest for a light of the people. My righteousness is near, my salvation is gone forth, and my arms shall judge the people. The isles shall wait upon me, and on my arm shall they trust. Lift up your eyes to the heavens, and look upon the earth beneath, for the heavens shall vanish away like smoke, and the earth shall wax old like a garment, and they that dwell therein shall die in like manner. But my salvation shall be forever, and my righteousness shall not be abolished. In Isaiah 51 here, we, see, we again see the servant, except now God himself is the servant. It is he talking to his nation, and he's asking them to join him. But they ended up rejected, rejecting him. Hearken unto me, you that know righteousness, the people in whose heart is my law. Fear you not the reproach of men, neither be you afraid of their revilings. For the moth shall eat them up like a garment, and the worm shall eat them like wool. But my righteousness shall be forever, and my salvation from generation to generation. Now in the second part here of Isaiah 51, we see that he's talking to Christians. He's talking to those who accepted him and who are being persecuted because of it. This again we see in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 8 to 13, where we see God is the Savior himself. Bring forth the blind people that have eyes, and the deaf that have ears. This is talking about the Jews who are blind and deaf, even though they have eyes and ears. The Jews in Jesus' time, who could not hear what he was talking about. They were blinded by religion. Let all the nations be gathered together, and let the people be assembled. Who among them can declare this and show us former things? Let them bring forth their witnesses that they may be justified, or let them hear and say it is truth. You are my witnesses, says the Lord. Now he's talking to Christians. And my servant in, in whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. I have declared and have saved, and I have showed when there was no strange God among you. Therefore you are my witnesses, says the Lord, that I am God. Yea, before the day was, I am he, and there is none that can deliver out of my hand. I will work, and who shall let it? So again, this is talking about the gospel being brought in by Jesus Christ, and the righteousness of God, the light to the Gentiles. I, I remember so many times reading a lot of these verses and learning things that I'd never heard before. It's, it's just incredible, the, the information in Isaiah, this is we're talking about 700 BC for Isaiah, 1000 BC for the Psalms. Um, it's just incredible that the stuff contained in here. Thanks again, and I will see you in the next episode. It will be called the Key of David. <laughs>